Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I'm going to discuss water diarrhea caused by protozoa. The learning objective is to describe the pathogenesis and clinical findings in Giardia and Cryptosporidium watery diarrhea. Here's the summary table for watery diarrhea. Remember that the anatomic location affected in watery diarrhea caused by bacteria and viruses is the proximal small bowel. This is also true for protozoa. Similar to bacteria and viruses, watery diarrhea caused by protozoa can be an acute illness that self-resolves. In contrast to bacteria and viruses, some protozoa can cause a chronic diarrhea, and in some patients, the illness can be life-threatening. I'll talk about two protozoa that cause watery diarrhea. They are called Giardia and Cryptosporidium. For Giardia, the trophozoa is the only stage. It's teardrop or pear shape and has two nuclei. They look like eyes. It also has flagella. And you can see all these structures in the 3D reconstruction made from electron micrographs. The two brown eyes are the nuclei. The ventral disc is the green structure. I'll talk about this more later. And there's lots of that stringy stuff, and those are the flagella. Here's a trophozoa outlined in pink color from a Gimsa stain, again showing you all the structures. In the video on the bottom, you can see that these have really complex movements. It's hard to believe that this is a unicellular organism. You might imagine that the trophozoite is swimming around to get somewhere. Well, that's correct. It's swimming and cruising around on the surface of your intestine to find a place to attach. The green structure that I showed you before, that ventral disc, allows attachment. When the trophozoite finds a place to adhere, it uses the ventral disc as a suction cup, grabbing on to the microvilli of the enterocyte and holding on very tightly. It prefers to attach to microvilli in duodenum and jejunum. Trophozoites can disrupt tight junctions between cells, and they can also induce apoptosis. Both of these disruptions can potentially lead to diarrhea. But what seems to cause a big problem is that trophozoites can reproduce and grow on the microvilli. The result is a massive sheet of trophozoites that cover large portions of the small intestine microvilli. In this electron micrograph of a small intestine of a gerbil, you can barely see the microvilli underneath, but what is obvious are all of the Giardia trophozoites attached on the surface. You can imagine that your enterocytes don't work very well with lots of things stuck on top of them. In fact, Giardia trophozoites block enterocytes from absorbing nutrients, including fats. Malabsorption is what likely causes most of the diarrhea. Unabsorbed nutrients causes an osmotic gradient that pulls water in. Unabsorbed fat leads to fatty stools, or steatorrhea. The unabsorbed fat in the colon gets metabolized by bacteria in the colon, the microbiota, making foul-smelling gas and abdominal distension. So now you know why these patients have really foul-smelling flatulence, bad abdominal cramping, and distension. They are nauseous and don't feel like eating. And over time, the malabsorption can cause weight loss. Time is definitely an issue. Giardia can be a chronic diarrhea lasting weeks to months, although the symptoms can wax and wane. In places where this is endemic, some people can actually be asymptomatic carriers. Please remember that Giardia is not just some uncomfortable, foul-smelling infection with no other complications. Giardia occurs quite often in developing countries and affects children disproportionately. Chronic and repeated GRD infections can significantly contribute to the malnutrition that many of these children already suffer. The end result is growth retardation and poor cognitive development. So how do we get Giardia? In order to transmit, Giardia produce cysts, which is what is shed in feces. And it's, what the, and it's the cysts that we unknowingly ingest. These cysts are very resistant in the environment and very infectious. You need to eat only 10 to 100 cysts to be infected. Once you ingest the cysts, the cysts know when to hatch into a trophozoite called exostation. It first experiences the low pH in the stomach and then the high pH of the duodenum. In the developed world, most of the infections are zoonotic. The typical story involves campers or travelers who drink water contaminated by various animals. In more endemic regions, there is also human-to-human -human transmission from infected human feces. Now, as the trophozoite travels through the colon on its way out, many will become a cyst again, called encystation, triggered by the low bile concentration in the colon. This is one watery diarrhea that you can diagnose mostly by history. The patient will tell you that they have been traveling, they've had diarrhea for weeks, they may describe foul-smelling fatty stools that float in the toilet. You can do tests to confirm your clinical diagnosis. 
Cysts in the stool can be detected by microscopy through a test called OMP or ova and parasite. The top picture shows you trophozoites and cysts, the round blue things, in the stool. There are also antigen antibody detection tests, and the bottom image uses a fluorescent monoclonal antibody to detect Giardia cysts. This is an infection you want to treat. Interestingly, the main drug is an antibiotic called metronidazole. It's usually used for treating anaerobic bacteria. So why is a protozoa susceptible to an antibacterial drug? It's because Giardia and its cousin Trichomonas evolved during a period where mitochondria were not incorporated into eukaryotes or they lost their mitochondria. So Giardia have no mitochondria. Thus, it has anaerobic metabolism. Metronidazole is activated under anaerobic conditions and this is why Giardia is susceptible to it. Metronidazole's mechanism of action is that it causes DNA damage. It's well absorbed in the body after oral dosing. A common side effect is gastrointestinal upset. This is because the antibiotic is killing many of the anaerobic microbiota in the intestinal tract. The other protozoan that causes water diarrhea is cryptosporidium. It is not related to Giardia. It is a member of the AP complexa, which makes it more related to toxoplasma and to plasmodium, the agents that cause toxoplasmosis and malaria. Cryptosporidium also forms cysts, and like Giardia, a low infectious dose of only 10 cysts will cause infection. Similar to Giardia, finding cryptosporidium cysts is used for diagnosis. They can be seen on a wet mount of stool, that's in the top left image, or with an acid fast stain of stool in the top right image. You can also detect cryptosporidium using PCR and antigen detection tests and direct fluorescent antibody tests, which you can see on the bottom image. Cryptosporidium is usually transmitted in contaminated water. The hallmark of cryptosporidium is that it has very resistant cysts that are not killed by chlorine. The classic outbreaks are in public swimming pools, water parks, and even city fountains where children have been playing. The only way to get rid of cryptosporidium is to filter them out of the water. Clinically, cryptosporidium causes a self-limited watery diarrhea that lasts about 10 days. This is the common scenario for someone who is relatively healthy and immune competent. However, the illness can be more severe in infants, and in malnourished children, it can cause a persistent diarrhea, and like Giardia, the exacerbated malnutrition can stunt growth and cognitive development. The story is very different in an immune-compromised patient. Cryptosporidium can cause a chronic, profound, intractable diarrhea that is very difficult to treat. These patients can lose up to 10 liters of stool per day. In the early days of the HIV epidemic, before antiretroviral drugs were available, patients with HIV and AIDS lost copious amounts of stool, doctors were having trouble keeping them hydrated, and drugs used to treat cryptosporidium weren't having much of an effect. These patients died. In fact, cryptosporidium infection is an AIDS-defining illness, so it should not be a surprise when I tell you that cell-mediated immunity is important in controlling cryptosporidium infection. Antibodies don't help too much. Other patients with cell-mediated immune deficiencies, such as those with organ transplantation, can also have a very severe diarrhea. I have treated children with kidney transplants who were infected with cryptosporidium and can personally tell you that these patients can have a lot of diarrhea, it is life-threatening, and it is hard to treat. For one patient, we had to use many different medications to resolve the infection, which lasted four weeks every day, losing up to two liters of stool. In the end, it may have been a reduction in his immune suppression medications that helped the most. So once we ingest the cryptosporidium cyst, what happens? Existation occurs in the small intestine triggered by sensing the passage through stomach and bile. What hatches from the cysts are banana-shaped sporozoites. You can see these in the drawing and the electron microscopy image. These have gliding motility very similar to the cousins to plasmodium. The sporozoites eventually attach to the apical membrane of the enterocyte. It attaches by using a unique apical complex structure that is seen in all the AP complexa members. You can see the attachment in the cartoon drawing and the electron micrograph of a sporozoite with the apical complex at the bottom. The sporozoites colonize the jejunum but can spread throughout the gut in immune-compromised patients. When attached, it uses its apical complex to secrete things into the enterocyte, triggering the host microvilli to crawl up and grow around the sporozoite, covering it with a thin double membrane. In the image, the arrow is showing you where the host apical membrane is halfway done covering the sporozoite. The membrane does not completely fuse, as you can see in the image. The arrow shows where some openings remain. 
Thus, the sporozoite resides in a special vacuole, but it is not truly intracellular like its cousins, Toxoplasma and Plasmodia. It's epicellular. The sporozoite also has a special organelle that connects to the enterocyte to get nutrition. It's called a feeding organelle, and the arrow points to it in the image. The mechanism of how sporozoite attachment to the enterocytes cause diarrhea is not well understood. The enterocytes die, and you get blunted microvilli. As I said before, treatment is difficult, and the medications may not be very effective in immune-compromised patients. There are drugs available to use, and I have listed them on the slide. But disease resolution is also dependent on a functioning cell-mediated immune response. This is an important point about treating infections in immune-compromised patients. Getting the immune system to help fight infection can be very useful in resolving cryptosporidium infection. For example, antiretroviral therapy in AIDS patients and correcting chronic malnutrition helps resolve the infection.